Tired of sifting through endless resumes? Introducing Eva, your AI-powered profile matcher. Simply input your job requirements and let Eva do the rest. Revolutionize your hiring process with Eva, the smarter, faster way to build your dream team. Ready to unlock the power of AI in your recruitment journey? Try Eva now. Spearsoft. Empower your hiring journey with artificial intelligence. Welcome to TV5 and Mana TV, another episode for Indo-Americans, live from Atlanta. I am Praveen Puram. I'll be the host today and I have my esteemed guest, Mr. Dr. Avinesh Bird. So our topics have been uh, very different, wide variety, which is used for Indo-American community. Today, we will definitely more deep dive into what is a sleep management. I know it's it sounds very easy sleep we do every day but you know there are so many implications to the sleep how do you manage them how do you have your sleep before that i wanted everyone all the indo-americans who are watching or you will be watching after this i would encourage you all to do you you contribute your vote right so definitely please vote make use of your vote and ensure if any indo-americans are in the race please support them we need our voice in this country in this wonderful country so that we can make ourselves comfortable without any further delay i would love to introduce dr avinesh very good morning avinesh in spite of your busy time i think you are spending some time with us it's very great and i just wanted to introduce yourself and then we will get into the crux of sleep management. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me this morning, Praveen. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Bird is a fellow. Uh, he's a fellowship trained and board certified sleep and pulmonary medicine. He has been practiced for over seven years following the completion of fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis and University of Tennessee, Memphis. He also holds an MBA from Chicago, University of Chicago. So he has also many awards. I will not go detail into the awards, but uh, one yeah. few of them which are very important to know about him. It's Asia 21 Young Leaders Award, Asia Society Teaching Award for Internal Me Medicine. And he also has many publications. Definitely, I would uh, let him speak. I don't want to steal the thunder. Over to you, um, Avinesh. Again, thank you so much from the entire group of sleep for helping the community from sleep management and having Indo-Americans in the health industry is always a blessing for all of us. Mm -hmm. And thanks to the sponsors, Peersoft, Sleep, and also Ready CPA for making these episodes running successfully. So over to you, uh, Dr. Avinesh. Did I miss anything from your introduction? Please feel free to introduce more about yourself. Yeah, no, I think the only thing is now it's uh, been way more than I think you can tell more than seven years from when I have uh, been in training uh, since training. So it's uh, it's closer to 12 years now that I'm approaching after finishing my fellowship. So it's uh, it's been a it's been a very rewarding journey. Uh, you know, my training took me to uh, into critical care and pulmonary medicine initially. Uh, and I did sleep medicine primarily because of a mentor of mine in Memphis who suggested, because I was kind of at a crossroads to figure out what I want to do. I wasn't ready to grow up, surprisingly, after six years of postgraduate training, meaning, meaning after six years after medical school, I still felt my training wasn't done yet. And my mentor pointed me towards sleep medicine uh, because he felt, uh, and and I, 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 I envy his vision because he was right, spot on. He said, I could be more used to my patients if I did sleep as opposed to doing something else within kind of more of a subspecialty, like in interventional pulmonology or, and so on. Um, and that's been huge, hugely rewarding to me because, like you said, sleep is, touches our lives every night, or every day. Uh, and um, there's, there's many of us suffering. The problem with sleep and the good thing about sleep is it's, it's primarily a, a single player game, which means that you're the only one that knows how your sleep is. You know, when you walk around, you can see when someone's short of breath, when you, they're in pain, when they're depressed, when they have a leg issue that they're not walking straight. It's very obvious, these kind of things. And, and when you see yourself suffering th through this and you see someone that's not suffering through that, you immediately have feedback that's a problem. With sleep, changes occur very gradually over months and years. So our expectation of how we should feel when we wake up changes. 
And then as human beings, what we do is we create stories. We create stories to make sense of things. And we create these stories of life of this, oh, I'm doing that, oh, I'm stressed from here, uh, kids, career. And uh, we then relegate sleep to just an afterthought that what I need to do to squeeze in some time, whatever time I have, but not realizing is actually the building block for tomorrow. Uh, you're kind of taking care of yourself so you're able to face the stress that you have tomorrow. And I think a lot of times we use then stimulants. You know, one of the most common stimulants is caffeine and cigarettes and so on, so that we then make up for the fact that our energy drinks now that's so prevalent to make up for the lack of good quality sleep. So it's not only so much a quantity of sleep, but it's also the quality of sleep that we get. You know, a lot of us are pushing for seven, eight hours of sleep. But the question is, after seven, eight hours of sleep, one is, can you manage that regularly? And when you do manage that, are you feeling refreshed? Because I think a lot of times patients don't realize that it is your right to wake up refreshed. Um, and if you're not waking up refreshed, it's it's kind of like saying, you know, if you if you went to the toilet to move your bowels and you didn't feel satisfied that you moved your bowels, that's something wrong. If you went to pee and you could not pee all of it out and you didn't feel satisfied after that, there's something wrong. If you felt hunger, but you couldn't eat much because then you just stopped and felt, uh, you knew something was wrong. Same thing with your sleep. If you're sleeping adequately, seven, eight hours, and that's the recommendation for the general population, then you should feel refreshed. And the question is why if you're not? Uh, and a lot of us turn to quick aids, uh, over-the-counter things, things that we see. And, you know, uh, someone told me the other day, I thought made a lot of sense. He said, why do you think the sleep aid section in CVS and all these pharmacies are the longest? It's because nothing actually works. Um, and it's all short-term fixes uh, when it should be actually looked at with, with a lot closer inspection because it's such an important factor that affects everything. And I mean, now that we're discovering the studies are coming out, it affects everything in our lives, right? From your mental health to seizures, to headaches, right down to your breathing, your lungs. It affects your heart. It affects your kidneys, your blood pressure. It affects your gut health. Uh, and there's so much that it affects that, you know, it makes sense that it has to be something we look at really seriously. Unfortunately, because it's a relatively new field compared to the more established fields within the within medical society, it is still kind of gaining its recognition, its foothold, and it's always a afterthought. You know, if you walk into your physician's office or your provider's office and you tell them, oh, I'm feeling fatigued, I'm not feeling really up to it, the knee-jerk reaction is I'm going to do blood work on you. I'm going to throw an antidepressant at you because, hey, it seems to fit checklist. And but no one's stopping to say, are you sleeping well? Are you waking up refreshed? You know, and these are two questions that every one of us should ask ourselves because we have to self screen. We cannot rely on the medical community to step up and say, oh, we're going to get the knowledge because we know now that even when a data data comes out that shows conclusive evidence of something happening, it takes about you know 15 to 17 years to get into mainstream practice. So now that nowadays the data is out there, anyone can go online, they can see. And so you have to fend for yourself. And you know, if you're not waking up refreshed or you've answered, no, I'm not waking up refreshed, or you're answering no to do you sleep well? then I beg you to reach out to get help because, you know, uh, herbal remedies, home brews, alcohol, all of these things, sleep aids, whether it's Ambien, Trazodone, over-the-counter Benadryl, all of these are quick fixes. But you have to ask yourself, is sleep, like you mentioned at the start of this, is a natural nightly or daily process for us? If I tell you, you have to do something fancy to go and pee or you do something crazy to go and before you go and, and, and go to the toilet to move your bowels or you have to do all these things just so that you feel hungry enough to eat you'll go back and you're like are you crazy and so that's the kind of that's the way we should look at sleep as well so I, I hope that's a good introduction <laughs> no, I think uh, uh, Dr. Avinash you have nailed down first of all thanks to your mentor right I could when I when I saw you on LinkedIn, I thought, "Wow, oh, sleep also has a doctor." I was shocked because we never encountered that situation, right? Why did I choose to give it to the community? This one is number one because of the gadgets, right? Mm -hmm. And social media. Everyone, if you see the screen time, minimum of three hours, maximum of six hours, right? So with this, the blue screen. So mm -hmm. are we sleeping right? You, you said rightly, if you don't sleep and wake up in the morning, it's not refreshing, then your day goes really done. Right? You literally wake up on the wrong side of the bed, right? Absolutely. I go to people, they say they're partying and, you know, they are 
all night they are up but is it good to help no obviously so that is the reason i picked to the community especially in us there will be a lot of because when you go to india people will be tired going here and there and they sleep but in us i know you you know that they will not be tired so easily here so obviously they'll be up watching gadgets tv movies mm -hmm. partying and all those kinds of stuff so definitely i thought this is a wonderful subject to see and i think you chose the right one because i don't see i also googled i don't see more sleep medicine specialists right yeah it is definitely in the us produces on average a little bit less than 150 sleep physicians a year oh 150 Yes and so and a lot of times you have to do a base uh specialization whether internal medicine or family medicine which is a 3 year specialization and then you know a lot of people at that point have medical school debt plus 3 years of working as a resident to think about whether they want to really specialize in sleep and again because the respect that sleep has not received yet um uh, a lot of people think oh it's not worth my time to give up another year of salary that i could earn to pay back And so yeah so there's definitely a a, a definitely a, a gulf for of sleep physicians and you know as society modernizes we all have to accept that tools that allow us the luxury because like you said when the US there's a higher standard of living here we get time to play right and a lot of times for people play is social media your own time whether you want to watch Netflix you know and 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 binge watch that it's fine as 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 something that you do to reward yourself but like you said if you're waking up the next day feeling unrefreshed then you have to start looking at all these things and seeing whether what can you slowly remove as a as a kind of a you kind of have to go through your list of like all right do I am I sleeping enough do I need to cut my screen time down um uh, because we all have those episodes where we go for a function we go for dinners we will wake up a little bit tired we have a little more than one or two drinks um and that's part of our life and we want to kind of enjoy life to the best of our abilities and if you're able to sustain that that's fine but you have to be honest with yourself when you wake up if you're waking up unrefreshed or you feel like your sleep isn't good then you have to start looking and 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 that's happening consistently not just one night or two nights consistently you feel and that's kind of my journey as well because i i had to self diagnose my sleep apnea a few years ago because i was kind of going through the same thing as well where i would wake up tired and the other thing was this it was a situation where i would wake up more anxious in the morning and i used to love work i used to wake up early in the morning i used to be an early riser 5:30 or 6 bang out the work get stuff done exercise and then i realized as i hit 40 41 i was snoozing a little bit more and then i was having a little bit more anxiety in the morning meaning that i would like oh my god i've got so much work to do uh, and uh, and and my wife mentioned oh I, i think i heard you snore a little bit and this is i'm not even allowed snore and that got me checked out i i checked myself out and it was true and i've got myself treated but i promise you this if i wasn't in this field i would never have thought about that because the symptoms were so subtle um and that's why i think you every one of us owes it to ourselves because we have the luxury of having sleep physicians that can help that people understand that sleep is a a you know now they call it uh, or what we're trying to call it is the fifth vital sign you know previously that the the drug and pharmaceutical companies used pain as a marketing tool and said that's the um you know the fifth vital sign but that's not true it is a concern but sleep has to be that fifth vital sign because when you wake up and if you have any issues related to sleep it affects every part of your body and that's why people tend to kind of feel like when they age their medical conditions start increasing and they start feeling like they're breaking down like everything in their lives starts not working um and you have to be honest with yourself if whether you're sleeping well and waking up refreshed absolutely i agree with you dr adesh so after doing so many episodes with great people like you i always want like 10 seconds or 15 seconds to tell about your daily lifestyle the reason i ask this is i want them to every one of us you need to adopt right either you need to learn from others or you have a self discipline so from your perspective what is your lifestyle in a day just in a high level how much time you sleep what you get up how, what's your practice yeah so i i generally wake up around 6 o'clock and usually without an alarm which which i love that feeling of waking up without an alarm I, uh, the alarm i think it's uh it's society's uh <laughs> uh kind of buzzer to you to kind of go wake the hell up uh and uh but the idea is that if you wake up consistently at the same time then you will eventually fall asleep at the same time or consistently most of us try to get into bed at a certain time to get our 78 hours in what we don't realize is the better thing to do is to schedule or be very firm about your wake up time 
because we all have the ability to stay awake for about 16 to 17 hours a day. Most of us have. And that range of 16 to 17 depends on what we've done during the day, whether it's physically or mentally exhausting. And so we have different factors that drives that tiredness. But generally, if you wake up at six o'clock, which I do, you know, I wake up, I will, I, now I started a new routine. I used to do more exercises, uh, cardio exercises in the morning. And I say I used I, I I switched that now to more stretching as I realized stretching has become such an important component of of, of aging, um, and so I'll do that in the morning and sometimes I'll do cardio. I will then have my breakfast. I have a chia seed pudding. I will have a cup of coffee, black, no cream, no sugar, uh, and I, I love the taste of coffee. So it's something I'm not willing to give up just yet. Uh, and then I I start work. I, you know I get my son ready for school and I help my wife as well getting our baby ready for school. Uh, getting our uh, eight month old as well ready for the day. And then I get to work, uh, and you know, work is work, and I'll finish up around five. I'll have lunch in between. I'm drinking. I usually drink a lot of water, so I've got this canister of warm water and lemon here. Sometimes I'll use green tea, and um, and uh, after work, it's kids and uh, getting them ready for the night and getting them ready with the shower. And then we have dinner around seven ish, and by nine thirty, I know already. Because that's kind of hitting that 16 hour mark, 15 and a half hours. I'm already tired. You know, we're watching a little bit of Netflix at that point. And usually by 9 45, 10, we switch that off and I'm off to bed by 10, 10, 15. And that allows me then to sleep through the night and wake up consistently at six o'clock. But I use a CPAP machine for my sleep apnea. So that allows me to wake up every morning more consistently, feeling like I got a great night of sleep. Excellent. I'm observing most of the successful people also follow like five o'clock, six o'clock. So um, uh, you are also, you know, whatever you said, I could match with most of the people um, who are successful. And uh, now let's get uh, deep into the uh, sleep management, Dr. Avnesh. Mm -hmm. So tell us what are, why sleep is so critical for the life, right? And for our well-being. And what are the most critical disorders you find in our life, especially in the Indo-American life, or it might be India, that's, that's okay for anyone. So tell us more these basics of uh, sleep health. Yeah, so sleep health can affect cardiovascular health, and that's one that we always uh, are worried about, You know, especially in the Indo-American community. The, uh, the heart disease risk factors are much higher compared to the rest of the population. Uh, it's got a, it's more of a genetic predisposition. We don't need to fit the the picture, the poster child of someone with bad heart disease. In the U.S., is someone grossly overweight, you know, much older. For a lot of Indo Americans, you can have you can be in your fifties and be somewhat relatively, but we can have a different kind of obesity on the inside that affects us in terms of our risk factors as well. So the idea that oh, I, I I'm not as overweight as that person means I'm well better off. Is, is a concern because that kind of throws us off into a feeling of that, oh, we're good and we don't have to improve our health. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the main things is to understand that, you know, our, the way we manifest some of our diseases is a little bit different, just like every racial group has a slightly different manifestation as well. So we can't look at someone else and say, oh, we, we're fine because I'm not as overweight as that person. Um, and then the other thing is the way we manifest heart disease is also very different. Uh, so a lot of times it may not be picked up by a regular practitioner because it's not only you underestimating your risk factors, but the person seeing you may not understand that you have a slightly different uh, risk factors as well. Because like you said, we're newer to this country and it's not as ingrained in, 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 like, uh, in medical school uh, uh, curriculum and so on. So I think we have to kind of be able to then fend for ourselves or at least bring this up as an issue. So sleep on heart health is, is a big connection. You know, headaches, uh, feeling or even seizure control, uh, right to atrial fibrillation, which is a heart rhythm issue, heart failure pulmonary hypertension, which is another issue related to your heart and your lungs, even asthma control and, and lung disease control is so affected by our breathing at night. You know, I know within the Indo-American community or even the Indian community, breathing has always been such an important part from our yogis and so on in terms of bring, breathing in life and so on. And we focus on that during the daytime, but there's no understanding of what goes on at night. And that's why it brings us to what I, what it seems to be an epidemic right now is of sleep apnea. And that's one of the most common things in most sleep practices, most sleep practitioners, as much as we'd like to see the zebras of medical uh, literature because it gets us excited like, oh, what a rare disease. The most common, the bread and butter, 80 to 90% of patients have sleep apnea. 
and it's very subtle in presentation. There are the diseases and issues within or sleep disorders. I think disease sounds sounds bad, but you know it's a sleep disorder which can be corrected. Uh, things like restless legs, insomnia. These are other issues that can affect us. You know, sleepwalking, sleep talking, uh, all of these issues as well. Night terrors. So these are all different sleep disorders. But by far the biggest offender in terms of in that group of, of sleep disorders is sleep apnea, which is basically a narrowing of the airway. And we normally associate it with someone who's overweight, older males, you know, your older uncle, your grandfather who was falling asleep in the on the couch. Ha ha ha. You know, Dada has fallen asleep again. You know, you can't continue a conversation or old people are, you know, like that. And that's not true. It's their sleep apnea that's affecting them. Because as you get older, just like as you gain weight, muscles in our body weaken. And the muscles in our airway as well weaken. And when that happens, the airway becomes more collapsible during the night. And it's collapsible because just like the muscles in your body that relaxes as you're drifting off to sleep, the muscles in your airway here as well relax. And that's why we hear snoring. And we normally say, oh, you have to be a loud snorer. Oh, he's a loud snorer. I'm not so loud. That doesn't mean anything because it's kind of like saying we all have to play the same musical instrument. And that's not true. We all make different sounds from our throat because we all have different musical instruments in our throat because a, a symphony would sound really boring. If it was just one sound. Um, and it would be too easy for us to diagnose someone. So the, the sound that we make, whether it's heavy snoring, light snoring, Olympic level snoring, even heavy breathing, audible breath sounds just by itself indicate a narrowing of the airway. We know that because right now you and I, while we're breathing, we don't make any breathing sounds. Absolutely. And that's because the airway is wide open. When we drift off to sleep and it relaxes, that's when it narrows. So air has to squeeze now from here to here. And once it reaches the lungs, the lungs have cartilage, which keeps the airway open. But all the way here, it's all soft tissue that gets relaxed and narrowed. And when it does, air has to squeeze through such a narrowed passageway causing that vibration or that audible breathing sound to occur. So that's what snoring, heavy breathing already indicate that there's a narrowing. Now think of sleep apnea as the worst form of that snoring. I didn't say the loudest form, just the worst form where the airway is not only narrowed, Praveen, but can sometimes come to a near complete close. Now, what this does to you is that instead of allowing you to get into this good, deep dream sleep and waking up all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, we sometimes feel like our sleep is broken up into pieces because we're like, I slept for seven, eight hours, but I don't feel like I got seven, eight hours worth of sleep. And the reason for that is this fragmentation of the breaking up of our sleep, which is due to the fact that when your airway narrows to such a point, the only thing that's going to open up that airway and rescue your breathing is the awakening of your brain. Because the deeper sleep your brain is in, the more relaxed everything becomes. So here you are, Pravin, you're trying to gain a deep sleep. He says, holy cow, Pravin, get out of there. Boom, kicks you back up, opens up that airway. Again, you're trying to gain a deep, deep, deep sleep. Everything relaxes, boom, kicks you back up again. So it's that fragmentation of sleep that stops you from getting into the deep, refreshing sleep. It is a fragmentation of sleep that leads to a lot of issues like restless legs or the perception of insomnia. So that's why a lot of people think they have insomnia because you know, in the medical field, insomnia is a diagnosis that we have to exclude other things. While in the layman's community, insomnia is just bad sleep, difficulty sleeping, difficulty staying asleep. So when we use the term insomnia, you walk into a practitioner's office and say, oh, I've got insomnia, I'm not sleeping well. The practitioner is going to go, oh, you have insomnia. And I'm going to give you this medication. But in actual fact, that fragmentation of your sleep is likely due to a breathing issue because common things are common. And so when you have this consistent narrowing and your brain keeps getting bugged awake, right? So you're trying to get into sleep, boom, your brain wakes up. When your brain wakes up, Praveen, in that state, it's not a it's not a gentle nudge. It's a jolt to your system because you were essentially suffocating. So if you think about it from that perspective, your brain goes, holy cow, what's going on? It sends down stress signals. These stress signals keep getting flushed into our bloodstream throughout the night we're asleep. And that's what keeps our system highly stimulated. You see, we should, be, we should be stimulated during the day, but at night we need to decompress, achieve what we call homeostasis, where the body's balance is achieved. Again, the junk that we've accumulated from the day before, the stress and all that stuff, whatever we've eaten, whatever chemicals the body or the brain has accumulated needs to be cleared out. Only with rest do we get that. Now with sleep disruption, because of things like sleep apnea, you're stressed and stimulated day and night. 
And that's what leads to heart disease, stroke risk, and issues related to, to mental health as well, because you're highly strung up, you're highly stimulated, but yet at the same time, you're exhausted because you haven't got enough sleep. So it is this thing that leads to this heart disease risk over and over again. And a lot of people mistake this for, oh, because you're not so overweight, or you don't snore very much, or I only snore when I've got a cold, or I only snore this, it doesn't matter. Because we have to look at it like no one's listening to you at three o'clock in the morning. I don't care how attentive your husband is or your wife is. They're not really listening to you at three o'clock in the morning to see when they're breathing. So, you know, I'd say if you're not having a breathing issue, if you don't think that, don't just, you know, don't rule that out because that's what we see commonly. People mistakenly think that they have insomnia. They go untreated um, because they don't want the diagnosis of sleep apnea because the poster child of sleep apnea is someone overweight. I never want to be associated with that. So that's the common things that really what we see. And so, you know, I'll, I'll uh, stop here and see what further questions you have. No, I think uh, it's scary, right? I was just thinking when you were talking, there is so much things happening during the sleep, but we don't even know, you know. Now I feel it's blessed when you get up, you are active and running, right? So now the question is, is the dreams, right? Are these dreams related to the sleep? Because some people get good sleep, good uh, dreams. They might get bad dreams. And I also heard some, like, for example, I have one person known, if she feels that tomorrow someone is going to die, she'll get up in the morning and say, hey, someone, I, I saw a dream of someone dies. Then it happens. What does that mean to me? Is this the sleep create some dreams or any science behind it? Well, there is some science. We just don't know what it means for a lot of people. Uh, regular dreaming is different com compared to dreams that have certain themes to it. Like a lot of people who had sleep disruption or breathing disruption due to their sleep. And I, I become more curious with this because I hear this thing. I, I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like I'm being chased and trying to be killed because your stress response is getting triggered. And you have phase shifting as well. So the sleep phase shifting is what leads to a lot of these sort of dreams and vivid dreams and so on. Is because you're not getting into that light, dream, deep sleep, REM sleep in a, in a nice gradual fashion, there's a lot of phase shifting, which is thought to lead to some of these vividness of our dreams and recalls. But again, you know, kind of having pre premonitions about something bad, that's still outside the wheelhouse of what we're trying to understand. We're still really at the basic understanding of sleep right now. Dream are still dreaming and, 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 and so on is still very much something that we haven't really put our finger on just yet. Absolutely. Whenever you get, please let us know. Yes, we will do. Dr. Avinesh, uh, today, if you go for a physical, right? So is there a need for us? Or what is that for, a, for us to trigger, whether it is a problem or not? How do we ensure? Because now when we go to physical, you see the blood work and all the stuff and you see the minimum things like the functioning of kidney or liver or whatnot. But no one talks about sleep. Mm -hmm. So is it that the candidate or any one patient should tell to the doctor or how is that if no one thinks ah, it's snoring, just ignore. So how does we need to get a trigger to our mind to go and visit a doctor? Well, that's true. And I think all of us, I think whether you're in Indo-American community or just in the American community or as, as a human race in general, I think all of us can agree on one thing. We don't want medications to, to live our lives. We don't want to feel like we're dependent on a medication. And a lot of us, as we grow up or grow older, we don't want fuss around our health. We want simplicity. And the one thing about simplicity is that it's achievable. Good health is not complicated. It comes down to three really important facets. Nutrition, mobility, sleep. As long as you're eating well, hydrating well, you're not drinking your calories, so just a lot of water, a lot of good, healthy, fresh foods, moving around a lot, stretching a lot, pushing. You know, a lot of times, especially in Asian communities, as you get older, you're supposed to slow down. You're supposed to restrict your activity. You're not supposed to push yourself because, oh, Dada, we don't want you to overwork yourself. It's actually the opposite. We should be pushing ourselves. We should be striving to be as strong as possible because if at the age of 60, I want to still be able to preserve the ability to carry my grandchild or my child, I want to do that at the age of 80. I have to be strong now, right? If I start being frail, so nutrition, mobility, and then sleep. So before you see a physician, is to see, do you have to do your own gut check? 
And you know, and when we go in and see a sleep phys- uh, or physician in general, the sleep issue is something that you have to bring up because if you feel like you're not waking up refreshed, then that should be brought up as a concern. Because honestly, if you get your sleep treated, you will simplify your life you will reduce your dependence on medications. If you take control of your life and not be a victim of just say, oh, whatever God uh, gives us, then we actually have those tools now. And it's not complicated. It's not expensive. It is not to an exclusive group of people. Anyone can achieve it. Three things. And so the thing is that all gets overlooked frequently is that sleep aspect. So if you're not sleeping well or waking up refreshed, bring that up to your doctor. Because if you get this addressed early on in life, that domino effect of health issues, you will stop that and delay that as long as possible. And you will simplify your life because that's the one thing that really starts things rolling out of hand is if you get, don't do these three things together. And so bring that up as well when you see a sleep physician or sorry, a physician in general. And if you need to get a sleep study done, it's easy to get that done nowadays. It can be done at home. It's no longer going to a sleep lab necessarily. It can be shipped to your home. So it's it has democratized access to care, whether you are in a small town in Texas or a big city in, in Pennsylvania, you know, you don't have to worry about, can I get good care? Good care now is available. We have the technology and it will simplify your life. And you don't want to deal with doctors figure out those three things absolutely those are the important thing you pointed out one is sleep one is nutrition and, and mobility the other one is mobility, mobility right? yes. so talking to all this definitely your lifestyle right your lifestyle should be definitely in such a way that you can have all these things right? mm-hmm. have some of the impacts what on the lifestyle i wanted to ask some questions because most of us are our professionals work hours long technology more of technology and uh, today before sleeping you have to see your whatsapp you have to see your facebook you have to see your linkedin so what are the strategies for all of the community to ensure that the lifestyle is not impacting your sleep good question so you know one of the things it's easy for me to stand here or sit here and lecture you about what you should do and you really have the hard decision to make to see what is in your life that needs to be changed and you have to change it within your means you know if you have you know four kids and they're all under the age of five years old you know yes you might have to go through a little bit of pain short term the good thing is you're likely also younger so your body can withstand a little bit of brutal beating for a while Uh, that becomes less forgiving as you get older so as you get older as well kind of looking back to make sure that hey other things and you know as as i also pass the age of i'm 44 now but kind of once i hit that age i started looking at things in a slightly different light like I knew I don't want to see a doctor. Honestly, I, I saw my first primary care physician just about two months ago. And that's my honest opinion. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I will confess that. But it's because I didn't want the hassle. I was busy and I was making excuses as well. And then I realized, you know what? I cannot leave this to chance. But I knew that what I was doing in my regular life in terms of regular sleep, taking control of my sleep, making sure I put the right things in my mouth, uh, and being disciplined about that. I don't have any cream, any sugar. You know, since the since I was a teenager, I've not had my cha with any sugar at all. Uh, and I've gone, after two weeks, you get so used to it that any sugar and anything tastes overtly sugary and sweet. So these are small uh, sacrifices you have to make, but it's a sacrifice that will bear about a lot of benefit. And it's not just like, oh, I'm taking something now, like I'm going to sacrifice this sugary drink because I'm going to protect myself five years from now, you actually start feeling better within a few weeks. You know, people who stop smoking, they're like, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. You quit that within two weeks, you already feel different. That feedback is already there. So you don't need to kind of convince yourself and keep motivating motivating yourself. All you have to do is change something for a couple of weeks. So simplifying your life, really, I mean, like I said, there's nothing complex about this. You know, our lifestyle is one and trying to make sure that we set aside time for that sleep is so important. You know, uh, the mobility is another crucial aspect. And I'm not even talking about you don't need to put on spandex and join an expensive gym. You can just do these exercises at home, whether you have a I have a push up bar and I have a mat to exercise. I do my sit ups. I can do my squats on that and I do my and I do my uh, uh, push ups. And that's what I do. That's that's my then I do my stretches on my on my mat. It's not expensive. The push-up bars are less than $20 on Amazon. The mat is $20 on Amazon. So it's nothing fancy. 
I could make it fancy. You know, some people say, oh, I, I need to, you know, New Year's and I need to do this perfect. I need to sign up for this gym. I need to buy Lululemon pants. I need to do, you don't. <laughs> You don't, you don't need anything fancy to eat as well. You just need to eat a healthy diet. You know, sometimes we can cheat. Sometimes we're going to buy food from outside, but ha having to make sure that you're able to make fresh food or able to have fresh food delivered to you is so critical. So that nutrition aspect, having water accessible to you all day long, when you work, not caffeine uh, is going to be key as well, because caffeine dehydrates, it stimulates you, it strings you out. And so you want to just keep these simple things simple so that you can preserve a good life. And because at the end of the day, if you get those three things right, everything sim is simplified. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that uh, knowledge. Let's get into uh, sleep management techniques, right? So most of the, I, what are the some practical tips for someone struggling with insomnia or irregular sleep patterns? And share some insights, if any of the nutrition, which helps the mm -hmm. sleep, sleep cycles. Let me, let me, yeah, let me address nutrition first because it's, it's so much key to what we do. And especially if we're working late and so on, is that if you're going to have a meal close to, to bedtime, and I mean close, meaning the next couple of hours, you have dinner around eight and you're going to sleep at, at, at 10, you want to avoid something high in carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of rotias and so on have a lot of carbohydrates and then it's sluggish, it's slow digestion, digestion as well. So it might feel bloated as well. So kind of keeping that to a, a, a minimal level, and I'm not saying cut it out because we all have our cultural needs and so on. And, you, you know, you can't change our diets drastically, but you can keep the components of it the same just the proportion of it different, right? It can be a much smaller proportion of, uh, of, of, of things like wheat and so on and rice and much heavier on the greens and making sure that, that the proteins are also present. And so making sure those that is available to you, even if you're working late. Now, if you have the time to make something earlier, then go ahead and do it. Uh, but generally, you want to you wanna avoid high in carbohydrate diets close to bedtime, and you would prefer more protein uh, closer to bedtime as well. You know, things like alcohol definitely disrupt sleep. It's also the most com one of the most commonly abused sleeping medications, you know, medications, because it does get us to sleep quicker, but it disrupts our sleep a lot more later on at night. So trying to avoid those kind of things is definitely helpful. Uh, in terms of management of, of sleep issues, you know, one of the things is this is, like you said, once if you've checked off no to whether you have sleep waking up refreshed or whether you're sleeping well, either one of them you're saying no to. And it's not something that's, oh, just this last one week. I'm talking a few months that you're looking, OK, there's something going on here because something's changed because there's an acute issue that generally is two to three months. You know, whether you have a work stress, family stress, career stress, whatever you call it. That's short term. If this continues, then you kind of look at yourself and say, okay, what's going on here? And, and make sure, like you said, screen time is looked at as a potential cause. You know, is, do you have the right bedroom environment? Is it cool? Is it dark? Is it conducive for sleep? Do you have the opportunity for seven to eight hours? That's another key factor as well. So making sure you have that time to say, and, and one of the things is sleep, and I mentioned this before, is the wake up time is the cornerstone of predictable sleep. I think all of us hates unpredictability. Like I love my bowel movements in the morning. First thing I wake up, boom, get it out of the way. Check, high five to myself, right? <laughs> and so even same thing with sleep. You want to be able to know when you're going to feel sleepy because then you prepare when you want to have dinner, when you watch TV, you play with your kids, because then you know you're marching towards your bedtime. But if your bedtime is all over the place because your wake time, you see, we as human beings, what we tend to do is, oh, I slept today at 11 o'clock at night and I normally sleep at 10, but oh, something's happened. At 11 o'clock, I go to sleep. I wake up now, I set my alarm, let's say for whatever reason, an alarm o'clock set is at six because I always wake up at six. Now I wake up at six and, and, but let's say I don't wake up at six and I say, I, oh, I, the, the alarm clock goes off and I'm like, oh my God, I slept at 11. That's why I feel tired. I'm going to sleep in for an hour. So now you sleep in till seven instead of six o'clock. So your 16 hour stop clock starts at seven o'clock in the morning. So you fast forward 16 hours, that's 11 at night. So tonight, when you get into bed at 10 o'clock, your usual routine, and you're not able to fall asleep, then you go like, oh, what's going on? And that's what the unpredictability causes us. Then we say, okay, I can't go to sleep tonight. Oh, last night was a bad night. I, I couldn't sleep. And you see what happens when you lie in bed. And I, and I, and I don't mean this in an offensive way. We, I hear the story all the time. Oh, my mind won't shut off. And I'm thinking to myself, 
Bicep, you're not you're not the only special person that's trying to solve the Middle East problem in your head or trying to balance your debt in a, the country's debt in your head. I apologize. I know your mom told you you were very special, but you're not that special. It's not that your mind won't shut off. It's that your timing of sleep is wrong. Because when you lay down in bed and if you're not falling asleep and if you've been used to now not sleeping well, immediately the red alarms go off. Like you get in bed, you're like, okay, why haven't I slept yet? Oh my God, it's going to be like last night. Oh my God, I've got so much thing to do. Oh, I've got this to do. I'm going to wake up feeling so bad tomorrow. I have to drop off the kids to school. And so immediately your anxiety goes up instead of mellowing down and relaxing, right? So it's actually your sleep timing is key. The predict And what we don't realize is the wake up time that really sets the tone for the rest of your day and even your wake, your sleep time at night. So don't try to get into bed because it's socially acceptable like, oh, I have to go to bed because my husband goes to bed at this time. Because if you slept in for an hour, chances are that you are not going to likely fall asleep at the same time as he is. And then if you're going to get on your phone because now you're not asleep, then you're stimulating yourself. And then your bedtime becomes even further back. And then you sleep in a little bit more. Then you kind of wonder why, because your, your sleep schedule keeps changing back and forth and you can't figure out where you're at. And that's what drives a lot of the bad habits that we try to do then and work on kind of getting stimulants during the day, caffeine, energy drinks, and so on. So set your wake up time. Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of medications that we take, whether it's for uh, prescribed and, and non-prescribed medications can have an effect. Even alcohol can affect, cigarettes can affect our quality of sleep. So look at all these things, factors that are close to us that we've just accepted as a normal part of our lives. They can affect our sleep. So, you know, once you get the sleep scheduling right, then try to figure out what else within that, you know, medications you take, like you talked about diet, screen time, opportunity for sleep. Is this the right environment? Uh, and try to assess that as, as simple to do so that you can solve your own problem. Now, if you try all of that and it hasn't worked, then come to a sleep uh, practice or sleep practitioner to help see what else is going on because it may be something else that may be looked at by us before we can figure it out. And then, like I said, it doesn't mean that we're going to throw chemicals at you and say, no, you have to, you have to take Ambien. You know, I always feel as a sleep practitioner, if we figure out your problem correctly, we might be able to reduce your need for medications as opposed to increase your need for medications, not only related to sleep directly, but potentially if we solve your sleep issue, it has a positive effect on all your other health issues like your diabetes, your blood pressure control, your heart disease, your mental health, and so on. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit of cultural factors. Do you think culturally everyone has their own food habits, different foods, right? Different environments where they come from. So does that also affect the sleep? Yes, it does. You know, and again, that's also sometimes even cult, even family to family, you will see vast differences. You know, and it, it, you know, I've been talking this thing called sleep leadership, which is, which is that you know, it, CEOs of companies need to give more, more attention to sleep because it has such an impact on the productivity of the rest of the organization. And if you, as the leader, show that sleep is, you know, there's this bro culture in, in, in Silicon Valley where. Oh, I, I didn't sleep all night. I was on this energy drink, you know. And, and if you, as the, the 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 leader of your household, it, are not putting preference on sleep, you tell your kids you go to sleep now. Papa and mommy are sleeping twelve o'clock because we want to watch the show. You're setting a bad example. You need to be able to make sure you lead your organization the same way you lead your family, and that's why putting weight weightage and and, and and depth, you know, you got to lead by example, and making sure that you say, "Hey, I need to get sleep because I need you to grow, and I'm going to sleep now as well." So my bedtime and my three and a half year old son's bedtime is barely an hour apart, an hour and a half, you know, and so we also put the same amount of weightage on that. So that that comes, I think culturally is one thing, but I think even from family to family, we see such a variation in, in, in how much respect we give sleep. And I think that that filters down to to, to everyone else, whether you're running a, a Fortune 500 company or whether you have a household of four people. Absolutely. So I think the culture, uh, if you see the American lifestyle, everyone sleeps early and wakes up early, right? So most of our parents also do that. What is your suggestion to the parents? Everyone should, uh, all the kids, we need to make them a habit of sleeping like by eight o'clock, nine o'clock or? In, in different ages, yes. You know, when they are when they are less than, than 12 years old, they need about 10 to 12 hours of sleep. You know, that's always good. Now, teenagers, because of their uh, growing personalities, it might be difficult, but again, it is to impress upon them what issues they have in the daytime that's within their control that they can have at night. If they're struggling to wake up and they're not performing well at school, they have behavioral issues and so on, 
is to address that sleep issue because that that's going to be a cornerstone. You know, a lot of kids nowadays are being diagnosed with ADD and so on, but a lot of it is because no one's asking them about their sleep. No one's actually getting them to sleep enough. And that concerns me because we don't know the long-term effects of these medications. Yes, they might get them through their school year this year and next year, but are they going to always need a stimulant to stay focused? And is there a better way that we can address this? Um, so definitely, I think in terms of trying to uh, making sure, and, and again, the recommendations, you can go on the website and see the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has the national guidelines in terms of the amount of sleep that's required by toddlers, you know, up to the age of 12 and adults and so on. And for most adults, it's seven to eight hours. Now, you know, some of us may get six hours and 45 minutes one night because we just didn't have the opportunity. But in general, we need to have the opportunity to have between seven to eight hours of sleep. And I always tell my patients this, don't just listen to me or, or the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. You do it yourself you sense the difference. If you feel it's worth your time to be stricter about your sleep so that you're getting enough because, hey, my relationship has improved. Or, hey, my work has improved because I actually am not grumpy when I get to work and I'm actually enjoying it. So when my boss gives me more work, I'm just like knocking it out. Oh, wow. And, and so if that, if you see the connection between sleep and your actions, then or the outcome of it, then you're like, oh, I see it. And it's not difficult to see. All you do is challenge the person to try something different just for a week or two and say, hey, don't listen to me. You see for yourself if it's worth worth the sacrifice. And I think many people come back to you and say yes. Absolutely. I think uh, that's definitely the habits. You need to practice the habit, have a, a very a tight timelines. Like if you are... If you want eight hours, you have to sleep for eight hours. Someone And if you can't sleep for eight hours because you're trying and you still can't, then you need help and figure out if you're still tired. You know, that's that's going to be the important thing is to, to kind of be introspective about, okay, am I getting what I want out of this? Am I actually waking up more refreshed now at seven and a half hours? No, I'm not. Okay, maybe I need to seek a, profession, a professional, see if there's anything else about this. Exactly. So, Dr. Avinash, now let's talk about more sleep, right? You being the CEO of sleep, and you do most of the sleep management. So tell us more about what kind of technologies you use and what kind of softwares you use and how do you give the patients uh, a solution, right? So mm -hmm. when, when you go for any of the treatments, you have a plan. So tell us more, some of the treatments are the, the package kind of a solution what you give to the patients. Yeah, and, and you know, all we're, all we're doing right now is just bringing the technology that is there bring it easier to be accessed by patients quicker uh, and allows anyone anywhere not just big cities or you know first grade uh, me uh, metropolitans to have access to quality care because one of the biggest uh, probably uh, realizations that i had in in my career was when i moved from a tertiary care center like washu in st louis where i was doing my sleep fellowship and i moved to a small town in georgia I realized the disparity of care and people are so grateful for just care that I realized that they weren't getting great care. And there was ways that we could do this much more effectively. I didn't need people coming an hour driving time and waiting in my waiting room for 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, just to be seen filling up loads of paperwork. It wasn't necessary because I was solving their problems quickly. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, this patient came and waited for me and all I did was solve their problem in five minutes. Okay. And so that's where the idea is, could we, could we do this more effectively? And that's where sleep medicine or sleep telemedicine came about. So the practice name is sleep spelled S-L-triple-I-P, but it's pronounced sleep. And uh, the idea of telemedicine came about at that point because I, I realized that a lot of patients that I had were traveling long distances. And if you actually care about the patient, meaning that you're willing to listen and want to solve the problem, you don't need them come to pay. Uh, they don't need to come to the temple to you to pay pay homage. You can do it from anywhere. And so we can come to you, for example. So we do telemedicine and uh, we don't have any physical locations. All our providers or doc sleep board certified sleep physicians, they all work from home um, and uh, they're all throughout the country. And so what we are able to do is see patients in different states where wherever they are, we are licensed and allows us to do the televisit. We don't need to download an app nowadays. They're browser based. So you just click on a link, answer, you put in your name, put in your date of birth, it logs you in. It's super simple now. Uh, and then we see them for the consultation and we can run their benefits through their insurance because insurance now after the pandemic as well covers telemedicine because they understand that 
you know, there's such an impact on, on getting good care rather than keeping it, you know, further away from patients. Um, so improving access has definitely done that. So we run the insurance benefits, making sure that we're in network. We see them for the teleconsultation, figure out what their problem is. Usually a lot of patients will come to us. They will need a sleep study uh, to give us more information or validate some of our, 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 our clinical judgment or what they may have. And the sleep study nowadays are, are magical. I mean, I, it's, it's crazy because, you know, I was training the day when it was a lot of sleep labs and wires and even the home sleep test was wires just at home with maybe not as many wires. Um, and nowadays it's, it's a simple ring device with an app you download and they're all FDA approved because they're, this, they're nearly as good as an in-lab study. Now, I say nearly as good because the in-lab study has got way more data points to, to record, but we don't need all the data points to give us an answer. It's like saying not everyone needs an MRI to figure out what they have, right? So you don't need to go for an expensive MRI. We can send this test kit to you. It comes in a small box, instructions included. You put on the ring, you download the app, you sync the ring to the app, and it's all, you know, I tell patients this, if you can log in to see me on the televisit, the test is simple. Right. So, and we have patients who are above the age of 80 years old. I, you know, I had a patient who reached out to us and I think she was 89 years old. And I'm like, wow, we are reaching a lot of people. Uh, and it's, 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 it's very, uh, it's, it's for me, I, I knew or I, I, I feel that they may not have reached out for their, about their sleep issue if it wasn't easy. Because, guess, like I said, you know, sleep is, is very much, if you talk about, oh, cardiologist, I'm going to say, you know, and you know, everyone is very proud when their son's a cardiologist. I'm always apologizing to my parents. I say, I'm only a pulmonologist and a sleep physician, but in this cardiology, GI, all this, this talked about fields. And so patients have all of these doctors ahead of you. And they're like, oh, I have to see the sleep physician. Never mind. It's fine. I will try my Ayurvedic medication. I'll try my homeopathy. I'll be fine. So if people don't actually get easy access, so that's what allows us to reach a lot of people, get them tested. And in terms of treatment, we can provide treatment pretty easily. So like example, like I said, the bread and butter, what we mainly treat is sleep apnea just by virtue of the population having such an issue. Uh, we treat insomnia, we treat restless legs, we treat narcolepsy, nightmare disorders. We treat a whole lot of things, but common things are common and it's so easy to treat sleep apnea because nowadays with the technology, we can ship the testing kit, get the test kit back. I can read the results. They follow up with me a week. So from the first visit to the test and the return visit, two and a half weeks at most for a lot of patients. That's cool. That's cool. I mean, imagine that. I mean, previously it would be three months. And just to see the sleep physician, we can see a patient within a week of getting the referral or them booking an appointment. So the timeline is cut short dramatically so that patients then get, then they come back for the return visit. We discuss the results and we give them treatment options. Okay, the results showed this. Let's go ahead. And so, for example, in sleep apnea, I just want to show your 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 um, your viewers this. This is what a mask nowadays looks like. You'll see that this doesn't even cover the mouth; it sits underneath the nose. It's a very slick, easy. This is what a CPAP mask looks like. The hose is connected; it's about six feet long, connected to a small machine by this by the side of the bed. And all that machine does is detect when the airway is narrowing. It's got a special algorithm, a sensor that detects when the airway is narrowing. So it pushes more air pressure in, keeps your airway open, keeps your brain asleep. It goes back to what the yogis have been saying. Your breathing is key to life. And all this device is doing is keeping your airway open so you can continue to breathe well, bring in the oxygen, blow out the carbon dioxide so you have a great start for the next day. No chemicals, no funny business, just a simple idea of let's keep your airway open so you can breathe well, sleep soundly, and then you wake up the next day refreshed. Excellent. The next option is a dental device. This is a mouth guard now that sleep dentists can make. So we can refer you to a sleep dentist closest to you to make a mouth guard to treat sleep apnea as well. This keeps your lower jaw forward because there's a tendency at night for your jaw to slack back. Uh -huh. which drags your tongue backwards and narrows your airway. By keeping your jaw forward, your airway stays open because your tongue stays forward as well. So this device can be made and it's covered. All of it is also covered by your insurance because there's such a growing recognition of these issues in, in the community and patients need access to care. And we can refer, even the CPAP machine, uh, Praveen, when we ship the devices out, we set them up through a video call so they know how to fit the mask, they know how to connect it to the cloud. Because it, it connects to the cloud, I can actually adjust the device settings from my side. After I speak to you and you say, hey, Praveen, you've been using it for a few weeks now. Give me some feedback. Oh, I don't like the mask, Dr. Barr. Oh, I don't like the setting. No problem. We'll ship out a new mask to you and we'll go ahead and change your settings here. Boom, it's done. 
So it's so simple now that, and it, it's a simple idea. You know, people, a lot of people, and I'll, I'll, I'm speaking to, to people who are very concerned about, oh, I don't want to be addicted to this. And my retort to them is this, are you addicted to your shoes? You know, we, we put on shoes because we know the benefit of walking outside and not getting nails in, in stuck in our, in our feet and, and getting cut. And that's it, that saves us so much of harm and pain. The same thing, we have the technology now to help us sleep at night. It's not a dependence. It's a choice you make to say, you know what? I understand as you grow older that your airway may narrow and disrupt your sleep. And if I want to preserve not only just living longer, but I want to live the best life I can, then I need to look at and see how I'm breathing at night because daytime breathing is one thing. Nighttime breathing is not observed. So as a pulmonologist, I'm so focused on the 16 hours during the day and I never had the understanding of the eight hours at night. Now I do. And it allows me to be much more of a holistic doctor for my patients because I can actually address the issues. And there's so much benefit to, to what we're doing. And it's so easy to fix. That's that's what is crazy, Praveen. This is not some crazy expensive drug that I would tell you you have to apply for authorization. It's going to cost you $800 a month to buy. It's a simple fix. We have the technology. Don't wait. There is help. And it's beautiful sleep. Every one of us, our right is to wake up refreshed in the morning. And please try to give yourself that gift. I think uh, that's really cool. Uh, I didn't think sleep is that complication. But I, I am just watching you and understand, trying to understand there is so much science behind it. And so much things goes when we sleep. That's why I think people say that when you are awake tomorrow, that means you are blessed. You have a next to one day to live. So I can relate that. So coming to the long-term uh, sleep health, uh, Dr. Avnesh, so what are the uh, long-term health risks of chronic sleep deprivation and how can that be um, predicted early in the game? Yeah, so you know, sleep deprivation is 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 broken up into two things. Are you just having not enough sleep? So you're talking about the sleep opportunity. Are you not giving yourself enough time during the night to actually achieve good sleep? Or is it that you're deprived of good sleep because despite you giving that focus and attention to trying to get that seven to eight hours of recommended sleep, you're still not waking up feeling refreshed in the morning or feeling like you slept well. So it's two components to it, but either one. It, it brings about the same issues, the stresses on our body, the stresses on our aging. It, it quickens aging. It quickens aging from a cellular level. It disrupts the, the there's a lot of, um, now that we've looked at cells, our body cells, the body cells are amazing. And they're they are timed. They have this chronicity to it. Well, what they do is they actually based on specific timer signals. That's how they function. And a lot of it has got to do with that function of the timing has got to do with your sleep because the sleep is what triggers all of this sort of backup mechanisms to kick in while you're asleep, puts into place the hormonal surges, puts into place your insulin surge, your cortisol surge. We are such well-oiled machines. We're the only ones screwing it up. And so that's why we have to always pick that up to say, hey, I'm not waking up refreshed. Or I'm not moving enough. I'm not eating the right thing. And you definitely have to look at these things because that's what's going to have a huge impact on how you live your life. So the, the sleep deprivation is one thing in terms of fast-paced society. Oh, everyone's up late at night. Great. You know, we can do that. And I, I'm not talking to the 18-year-old and 20-year-old that's in college that's pulling off because so much of your life is driven by peer pressure and everything else. Absolutely. Now, it's fine if you are okay, you're able to get through and do well. But if you're not waking up refreshed and you have issues at school, just the same way that, you know, it's like I always tell this, you know, it's like I say, if you're a diabetic, you just can't eat that cake. I, I'm so sorry. Like, Yes, you can't. I know. I know your friend can eat the cake, but that's fine. You just—it's just the fact that you are sensitive to that cake, and you can't. Same thing. If you have insomnia or you have sleep issues and you're not waking up refreshed, then you really have to be honest about what changes you have to make to bring about the change. You can't just say, "Oh, Ajay does this, or Praveen does this, or so and so can do this." It doesn't matter. You are the CEO of your own organization here. And you have to preserve that. If you are suffering a consequence of one of your habits, then you have to make that adjustment. But Avinesh, you brought up a good point because people at our age, we cannot control ourselves. Talk about the children, right? How do you control them? For example, if they do not eat something, they cannot eat something. How do you convince them? 
that's the tricky part i always get Challenge. Yeah, and I, and I think that's going to be more of a, a habitual, uh, how you kind of bring about that convincing, because I think a lot of times kids don't reason, and that's why it's hard to kind of make them eat something. But if you're a teenager or someone older, you find out what's important to them. You know, I was talking to my niece recently, and she was having sleep issues. But what got me was, and, and I'll say this, because her concern was the fact that someone mentioned she had dark rings under her eyes. Uh-huh. And that's that's what alerted her to the sleep issue. Her mom had been telling me about her sleep issues for over a year. She's not sleeping well. Even when she gets enough sleep, she's still tired. That didn't bother, bother her. But one person in school mentioned dark rings and she became like, this needs to be fixed now. Right? So I think a lot of times we need to find out what's important to that person. You know, not one size fits all. Like you have to get good sleep because we have to preserve your health. You know, and when you're 35 years old and you're living life, okay, I, you know, this is something long term. But if you can point to something that's important to them, like, hey, because you're tired now, you're not playing football anymore. You're not playing soccer anymore because you're too tired when you come back. Or you have to come back and take a nap because, you know, you, you, get, you can't do the hobby that you love doing, whether you love gaming or something. That's how you connect it to something that's valuable to that person. And then you say, see, your actions are having a consequence of something you love. So if we change this, maybe you might be able to do that. So I spoke to my niece and, and the main thing is, how do we get you looking healthy and looking more preserved is the fact that we need to treat your sleep issue. And that's when we got her attention. So same thing with anyone else is to understand that what is important to us and connecting our behavior to that. And that allows us to then have that self-realization because you can only bring the horse to water, but you can't force it to drink it. Absolutely. That's true. That's true. Then what is your suggestion for the long uh, older generation? How to keep them hygienic on their sleep? Any I, tips? I think just don't be afraid about seeking help. I, you know, one thing I realized is as I get older, I get grump, crankier about what, needing to do things like eat this medication or take this vitamin. I'm like, just stop telling me what to do. Like, you know, it's okay. Don't fuss over me. Don't. And I, I realized I was doing that because now I see what my dad was doing. But I, I think one of the things is just for you to realize that the idea is that I know we want simplicity and mobility, nutrition, sleep. Focus on those three things. And if you do a checklist for yourself and if you're doing enough on those three fronts, then great. But if you feel like, hey, my sleep isn't great, don't be afraid to seek help. It is not going to be more fuss. The idea is to simplify your life. If we give you the ability to wake up every morning refreshed, then you can do with, with it whatever you want. Whether you want to do gardening all day, whether you want to read a book all day, you want to sit at the mandar all day, you do that. All I'm going to do for you is give you that opportunity. So just allow people to help because we're all here. We have the technology. It's not fuss because we know it's a simple fix. If I thought this was a complicated process, we wouldn't have a chance to survive, right? If I had to tell you, like I said, if you're going to take a, take a move your bowel, I had to give you five different medications. You had to hop on one leg and you had to walk around the house three times. You'd say, ah, oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> Same thing as well. Sleep is simple. It's a natural process. If it's not giving you the refreshing feel in the morning, that can be easily fixed. And easily fixed doesn't mean throwing more medications at you. It's just figuring out what the problem is and allowing us to help so that you live a good, fulfilling life. Excellent. One, one thing I wanted to tell you, if I am anger, if I have stress levels, or if I have any argument with anyone, my medicine is sleeping, if, whether it is day or not. For example, yep. if I fight with my wife, I am upset and we get an argument, then I go and sleep. Yes. That's it. Within one hour, I don't know what happened uh, two hours ago. I'll be very normal. My, my, team, my team had posted this on LinkedIn yesterday saying that stress is the number one killer of sleep. And then I reposted that saying sleep is the number one killer of stress. <laughs> That's true. That's really true. So anyway, we are almost an hour now, end of the time. Dr. Avnesh, what would be your three suggestions to the community for a healthy sleep i know you told three but again are there anything beyond that are the five i think just you know look look at the things that you're doing simple things like keeping a more consistent wake up time i know life changes and so on just a wake up time that's more consistent will allow you the consistency of sleep making sure that you're doing the three things i mentioned mobility nutrition sleep just look at that and be honest with yourself because you're the only one that knows if you're doing enough for each three Right, especially for sleep. You see, your, your spouse or your family member can see what you eat. <laughs> they can see how much you move around. So they can give you feedback, but they're not going to know 
if you're waking up refreshed because if you just wake up cranky every day it's like oh that's how he is that's his personality he's not a morning person you see how we tell ourselves these stories so we kind of fill our gaps of knowledge understanding with stories so the second thing is definitely look at those three aspects of your life and the third thing is this if there is an issue look at it don't freak out you know look at it over a span of time and then seek help if you need it because help is there it's simple nowadays telemedicine exists you don't have to get leave work i have patients that do it from their homes at the restaurant I, it's funny places they'll end up doing it uh, a telemedicine visit but it doesn't have to encroach in your day because for me as well one of the biggest things for me is was seeing a doctor was oh my god i didn't want to go and wait in the waiting room and and that's what held off me getting help for a longer longer period of time so you know i think nowadays the help is there so the third thing i'd say to that is reach out it's not as difficult as it used to be it's not as complicated and if we do the right thing we actually simplify our lives thank you thank you dr anvesh i think uh, how do they reach you it is s l i i i p dot com yeah so just go to our website if you need to book an appointment we're in 12 states currently and we should be coming to a state near you as well uh we are managed and run by board certified sleep physicians we take everything from medicare tricare to commercial insurances so just come to www.sleep spelled s l i i i 3 i's and a p.com book an appointment there get more information there we have a lot of blogs there as well uh see anything and if you have questions please reach out to us we verify everyone's benefit before they see us so no one's surprised with any bills one thing i've noticed is because we're telling people can switch off and not answer our calls so <laughs> if we, if we mess up on the bills we we would never get paid so we we will ensure that we take good care of you both clinically and financially thank you thank you dr ramesh for your time on the weekend and also this is the show where i bring all people like you just to give benefit to the indo americans right so thanks for having me watch this uh, from dr avinesh so sleep well be healthy move have good nutrition and have mobility right and yes also, sir please vote right we have another uh, 12 days or so please yeah. vote and uh, show your strength for the indo americans whoever are participating and with that said thank you so much and this will be telecasted and you will have a youtube link you can go and always check on that and if you have any issues talk to dr ravnesh or reach out to me i can facilitate the discussion thank you thank you thank you all good night have a wonderful day good night sleep well